Well, uh, just a little preface. Tonight's talk is held in conjunction with the solo exhibition Ignition, recent works by Jason Stout, which features over 50 works of charcoal drawings and vividly colorful oil paintings um, that are produced by the artist just within a short, actually, what, four or five year time frame. And the show will be on view through February 17th. So you can still come to the Clarion Eagle Gallery. There's still time to visit the exhibition in person, uh, masked and socially distanced, of course. Um, Jason Stout received his BFA in studio art from the University of Tennessee at Martin in 2001, and an MFA in painting from the University of Texas at San Antonio in 2004. Stout's work visually deals with elements of formal and figurative abstraction while exploring such themes as power, history, and identity, especially through the guise of Southern culture. His work exists in several private and public collections, including the University of West Georgia Jacksonville State University and the University of Tennessee at Martin. During his career, he has participated in several solo exhibitions, as well as several group exhibitions. He currently serves as the professor of art at the University of Tennessee at Martin and is represented by uh, REM Rim Gallery in San Antonio, Texas, and Certitious Succession Gallery in Memphis. Stout was named the TAEA Higher Education Art Educator of the Year for 2015-16 and Best of Show at the Art of the South in 2016. It's an award that he notably has. Um, he's also the recipient of the 2017-2018 Ray and Wilma Smith Award for Creative Research and the 2019 UTAA Outstanding Teacher Award. His work has been featured in a recent New American Paintings uh, ex exhibition in print catalog. And he even has a few upcoming exhibitions in 2021. And that's not an easy feat during our current COVID situation uh, <laughs> where many exhibits have been <laughs> canceled or postponed. So I will now turn the presentation over to our visitor. So please welcome Jason Stout. Jason, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you guys. I'm gonna try this share screen thing here and hopefully I won't botch it. We've not been able to get the exact format that we want. Uh, but we're going to get close. And what I would like to do is I'm going to go through this. Uh, thanks for T Mike for uh, running through in that great introduction. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to get some of these awards that he talked about. I don't think, however, I've ever won uh, any accolades for PowerPoint presentations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this and talk and I will look a little bit off screen because I have my monitor here, which actually has uh, the camera and I have the big screen here. And after doing two classes today, it's easier for me to read a big screen. So what I'm gonna do is go through this kind of quick. The work is an accumulation of all this stuff and the speed of the work moves kind of fast. And I found that when I get in the headspace talking about this work, I tend to talk a little bit fast anyway. There's a little bit of the excited Southerner in me. So I will try to slow down and pull back. Sometimes there will be text in this. Uh, so if I get going too quick, you can read along with me. I also do this so uh, it triggers certain things that I want to remember in the talk. Uh, but what I'm really interested in afterwards, uh, which I, I hope if anybody's here that wants to stick around and talk is, is questions from people, uh, artists, students, uh, general people that have went and seen the exhibition talking about and answering uh, questions about it and talking about too, if anybody wants to talk about the, uh, the art landscape now with trying to show an exhibit and make work and all that. Uh, I'd love to talk about that, uh, just artist to artist. So I think what Mike and I decided was that we could either do it like this. I mean, we've kind of had a nice good and, you know, back and forth sharing with talking uh, through this. It might be a little bit trickier now because there's more people in the room. But if we wanted to go through a chat and do a Q&A afterwards, or if we want to like use the chat and then pull somebody up and then let them mic up so we could kind of dialogue through a question or something. Um, I think that would be great. So hopefully you can see the screen. I don't see anybody freaking out like they can't. Uh, so I'll go through. And like Mike said, this is a body of work that I started uh, in the late mid fall of 2015 through 2019. And I'll kind of talk about how it started. And I'll talk about why uh, this body work stopped at a certain point and is now at Murray State and how that came to be. Um, let me see if I can click it like this. There we go. 
Uh, and that's a nice picture of me and that's some of my information. And if you have any questions about anything or want to see some more of the images, uh, my website is thejasonstyle.com. Uh, my web designer, Rachel Melton, is actually on here. I think I saw her a while ago. Uh, she set this up and works with me. She takes my images. She's organized this site. And if you are an artist looking to work with somebody that does a really good job on an artist's website, uh, feel free to contact Rachel Melton. Uh, she does a great job. And the work is actually organized on the site uh, in chapters of when I made them by blocks and years through media between painting and drawing. So you can look through that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about different kind of mindsets and modes that I go in when I'm trying to get in the mindset of making body works with where I started with before I made the work that's in the ex, uh, ignition exhibition and what I'm kind of thinking about. So I talk a little bit about postmodernism and think about it. And some of the initial ideas of this is that it's a challenge to modernism, uses simplification and appropriation, mainly from past styles, utilizes high and low art, usually from consumer and popular culture. And common themes in postmodernism include identity class, gender roles, power, consumerism, and globalism, which if you've seen the show, these are all things that I tend to address. Um, oh, I'm having such a hard time. There we go. Uh, I'm also struggling or, or, or tackling the problem of trying to make pictures in a modern age. And if anybody knows the history of theoretical painting, painting, you know, died uh, somewhere back in the late 60s and early 60s, and that everything that we're making now is somehow uh, a recycled permutation of what happened before, uh, but that our works now that we make have to be uh, indicative of talking about the age that we live in now. And I think that's a very important feature of contemporary art is trying to address the nowness of the world that we're living in. Um, there are usually two types of painters, and I hate to break them down because there's always exceptions to this, but we have painters that create works with stay within the realm of the abstract methodology with almost no recognizable subject matter, just elements of design. And then there are picture makers that use elements of narrative and storytelling, usually have recognizable subject matter, at least in parts, and also use elements of pure painting to make their work informed by art history, which means you have elements of abstraction, you have elements of narrative painting, uh, whether historical or modern, uh, whether abstract or semi-abstract. And uh, I tend to be more of a picture maker. Uh, I have moments in my paintings where I allow for abstract moments or things or decisions with colors and design to be a big part of the picture, whether it coincides with the narrative or not, because it's a good thing for the painting. And I still consider myself in a lot of different ways uh, a storyteller. Uh, I am from the South, I am from Tennessee. Uh, we are part of an old tradition that is uh, a big part of our culture and storytelling and myth especially, uh, that's part of that. So that's something that I utilize when I think about my work. Now, when I started to come up with the idea of making these cloud compositions from 2015, there are certain things that which I was trying to respond to as an artist at that time. Um, I wanted to work with ideas that focused on identity, power, class, consumerism, and culture. These seem to be the things that I was interested in in my own life personally, and biographically, the things that I tended to disseminate the most. Uh, I like thinking about mythology, folktales, Southern folklore, the news, current events in American history as ingredients for my work. I find, especially in the times that we live in now, not only do we live in uh, times that seem to have the utmost newness to them, but also too, we're living in times that really recycle so many things that we've seen in the past. And the continuity of those two things seemingly stacked on top of each other sometimes just kind of wow me. Uh, formally, like I talked about, I'm a picture maker. I use elements of recognizable sub subject matter, some abstraction, saturated color, and lowbrow art. I feel like saturated color in my palette is not something that's there for, say, a pictorial sweetness, which is, if anybody's a painter, you know, having something, having another painter call your painting sweet or saying they're sugary is not always a great thing. But it's the fact that there is a nowness in the amount of images that people see through television, computer screens, optics, things being sent through their phone that have to feel for me a little bit more electric to get into the visual language in which people are seeing on a daily basis. I find that some of the older kind of stylistic tendencies and processes that are in historical paintings stay very much historically in their place because their formal identity seems dated. And uh, I'm trying to use some dated things. I have influences and things that are important 
uh, that God made my work, but also too, I'm using a high saturated palette a lot of the time to respond to that. And I'm always in a conflict pictorially with the idea of Renaissance, Renaissance depth versus flat space, specifically the push and pull of the picture plane. And this gets into a compositional challenge when I was dealing with these paintings that I tried to hit head on. Now, the paintings I was doing right before this, the show before I started making the cloud paintings, was a show called Interiors and Exteriors. And what I had basically done is I'd been doing figurative narrative work uh, since grad school. So from about 2001 up until about 2012 or 13, to where I got into this series of paintings where I wanted to really just think about the surrounding areas that I'm putting my characters in, whether it was a landscape or whether it was in a room. And to do that and really think about the space and develop those areas, I wanted to take all the characters for the most part out. So I wanted to think about how to advance my environments and to do that, I really needed to strip all the figures out and just get them out of the way to just see the places. Uh, I found in doing that, I could really attack certain kind of issues that I was thinking about uh, where characters really didn't have to be a big part of it, that I could subtly sneak in little, po little points of narrative uh, that might inform things that I was thinking about. Uh, so this is one of the exteriors. This is Lenny Derrick's Sunset All on Canvas. It's a 12 by 12 inch painting from 2015. And we see uh, a, a mountain landscape here with an oil derrick with a little borehole right here. And with a ground with a small path, which is a very simple kind of everyday kind of picture device here with a path that's coming out. And with the top layer of the ground pulled back here to reveal shell rock on top of a water source that is sitting just beneath uh, the top part of the soil there. Part of where I got this sidewalk or this path from was not just a general kind of picture thing, but it was at the end of the trial of the Trayvon Martin death in 2012, where being bombarded with a lot of images from the time, one eerie image that I kept coming up with or seeing was this sidewalk image. And part of looking at the path and the darkness of this image and thinking how ominous and scary the path was moving forward out of an event like this was something that kind of stuck with me. Uh, the other thing that started to happen around the end of uh, uh, the trial and everything that went along with this is that my wife became pregnant with our son who's six now, but it really got me thinking about what it was like just to be a father and to raise a son or a kid in this world. We didn't know what he, he was going to be a son at the time, but later on we did, and it kind of resonated with me even more. And that Trayvon Martin himself looked like a lot of students that I had in my first year foundation classes. And then also, too, that my one day soon that my son would be 16 walking down a path at night, hopefully uh, by his home or somewhere close. And this, this was a situation that happened to him. And then how in this time that we were so close to something that just seemed so impossible that could happen in our culture, but that we're seeing is really not that impossible. So it was something that I was worried and thinking about. And it was part of the image that I took with me into some of these landscapes. The other part of the landscape that I was dealing with too is outside of just the personal uh, kind of politics and social things that were going on with my response to the Trayvon case was the idea of fracking and the information that was coming out about it at the time. Uh, particularly in how uh, the fracking process, which seemed at first something that was packaged as safe as safe and cleaner was something that could be really detrimental over time to our water source, which we were already in doubt of uh, or had problems with uh, at the time before this came about. So we were starting to see problems with fracking going on at the same time underneath these landscapes. And the danger to the water sources in the areas in which this was happening was starting to become uh, pretty apparent. So in doing these landscapes, I was trying to combine two modes of thought into one thing, dealing with this idea of this path with what I was thinking about being an upcoming father and dealing with my thoughts and feelings about this case. And then also dealing with what was, you know, what is it like to try to make uh, a new version of the great American landscape? Uh, when I was talking about these originally, I just said, you know, think post Mario Brothers meets Thomas Hart Benton versus the end of both. And that's really what I was thinking about is that how much of the landscape that I was making in my semi-abstraction reminded me of games that I played as a kid, especially Super Mario Brothers 3, which was a beautiful game. Although I wasn't really looking at images of it when I was designing these, but also to, also to 
how this sidewalk image from this image stayed with me and worked its way into almost all of these landscapes moving forward. And also to the idea of pulling out the foreground of this to talk about this issue with how I was thinking about hydraulic fracturing or fracking as it invaded these landscapes and man started to leave his mark. I was also doing interiors at the time, which were dealing with personal content or narrative that I was coming up with or going through in my own life, dealing with personal narrative. And this is Memento Mori Backroom Glory from 2015. So this was part of the same show, Interiors and Exteriors. And in here I have a skull and beer cans, which, you know, beer cans are kind of crumpled up or a kind of like a, a lowbrow way of doing impromptu, really quick engaged sculpture. I've just always thought that at the end of having a beer, manipulating and moving it around was a way of kind of doing it. But they're also too, when you fold them up, they're also inherently very cubist, which I like cubist painting. Uh, I like a lot of that early modernism. So the idea of having that on top of a book, on top of a round table with a floor, where the perspective doesn't quite make sense, uh, with a pack of cigarettes and bullets sitting on the table, the light bulb back here, and then some kind of silhouetted crime event, like a, a domestic thing happening in the background also going on. I'm a big fan of like a lot of different painting. And so this for me was kind of a nod to one of my favorite painters too, is Peter Clay's uh, Still Life of School and Writing uh, Quill from Oil, Oil on Wood, nine by 14 from 1628. Um, in these Vanitas paintings that Clay's was doing at the time, it was dealing with the temporary notions of life and how life is fleeting and it's only here for a short time. And so I was kind of doing a nod to that, but replacing some of the things that were in this picture with things that were, uh, you know, in my life at the time or that symbolized other things that were more immediate that ended or that got to the, the end of things, you know, such things as vice or, or violence or things like that. Uh, and also in a lot of these still lives, there were windows that alluded out to where you could see the landscape paintings that were partnered with the show. Now, leading out of these paintings, part of the thing that I was really wanting to get to was some kind of new frame or construction to do my images. Uh, the problem you have with a, with a canvas, if you're doing a very traditional way, is that the strengths become the weaknesses. Uh, you know, Carol Dunham said something about paintings once is that all the problems with paintings are the best things about them, that they're so flat, they're so square, they're so rectangular, they're so boring. That's also the best thing about them is that you've got to find a way to do something great out of those limitations. Uh, Peter Saul also said one time that one of the cool things about paintings is that you're basically using the same tools that people used to make paintings three or 400 years ago, you know, with a few exceptions, but it's basically the same thing. You're pushing around pigmented dust uh, or, or, or liquid in a, in a sequence of moves that are stacked or layered that dry at different times in a way in which to make something meaningful that somebody sees uh, for the most part on a two-dimensional plane. Uh, there was some certain problems though that I was trying to find to get around that were trying to advance my figurative paintings for. Uh, one is that, you know, in a narrative painting, it usually only exists at one time in one place and you have one narrative where cinema, which is non-static, can move around and tell lots of different stories and move from beginning to end with multiple viewpoints. And that's the challenge of how a painting can do something that uh, a movie can do. Uh, in modern time, we're constantly confronted with multiple narratives, multiple events, all simultaneously happening at the same time. The period from 2015 to 2019 was a very tumultuous period as has been the last year. And I found that the main thing that people were talking about was not one single event of tragedy or disappointment or something that was happening in the media or something that we were upset about. It was the accumulation of the stacking of all these things happening at the same time. Before you could get relief from one kind of event and move on to the next, something else was already happening before the other thing was resolved. And so what you were dealing with was with this constant stacking of all these things happening right on top of each other that you weren't able to process quick enough, especially not in one picture, one image. Um, these narratives came from television, internet, film, music, and advertising. And through the news and other media outlets, these narratives also spun, redirected, slanted with the idea of truth about anything constantly in flux. And so when I started thinking about things, I was trying to use them the way in which we were getting overwhelmed with information, we were getting overwhelmed with violence, we were getting overwhelmed with trying to figure out the flux in our own identity, and how different news outlets were spinning all this, 
how this could really lead to the construction of a painting that could solve all these things. Uh, at least I was hoping. Uh, so I talk a little bit about the other things that I wanted to put in here as my ingredients. I talked about saturated color. Uh, I've talked about layered images, you know, multiple perspectives, representing the field, being visually overwhelmed with information. Speed was a big part, having lots of things that moved in a way which, which mirrored or mimicked the speed in which media was giving us this stuff. Uh, I wanted to like think about an, an environment picture or a landscape picture that actually held content that wasn't seen just to be idyllic or beautiful. And that could I hide content in these places? I wanted to think about fracking, global warming and radioactivity and water purity. These were all concerns. Uh, I also wanted to think about the contrast between needing energy, energy and the conflict it creates with destroying where you live. I mean, we are consumers, so uh, we do need energy. We do need power. We need all this stuff, but also too, we need the the, the thing that's creating all this to also survive so it can, it can be our home. Um, I was also thinking about space a lot because you could get totally overwhelmed with all this stuff. And part of me thinking about space or dreaming about it was the chance to always kind of start anew, start fresh and escape some of this stuff, especially when it got too heavy. Uh, so I started to come up the, with this idea of like this kind of cloud because the idea of this cloud could do lots of things here, right? It could work on several layers and have several different metaphors. Clouds predict storms, which are tied to conflict and distress. They can reference comic books. Uh, space clouds or nebulas represent creation and pure energy. And the idea of the online cloud, a place that uh, stores information and unifies platforms. Uh, here information can be saved or discarded, lost but not totally lost. As consumers, this is what we're constantly doing with technology, whether in object or idea form. And I started to think about all the other things that held content for me and things that I consumed. And as now I was getting into my mid thirties, that how many things that I love so much that held information that gave me information through gaming things, uh, music devices and things like that were now kind of detritus. They were kind of retired and they were drunk or, or junk and they kind of lost their place uh, because they had been replaced by something else. They'd become obsolete and how the nostalgia of me with these objects as a consumer, but how this tied to my own history, how I had a longing for these things and thinking about all this. So these are two images I started to look at at the very beginning when I was thinking about these ideas. One of the ways in which I do my process of kind of how I work is I will gather lots of source images that I will stare at for long periods of time. And ultimately before I start painting or drawing, I will get rid of all of them so that when I draw them or try to recreate them, I inevitably always get it wrong, but kind of I get it wrong in my own way, which makes it original to what I'm trying to do. So the accidental process of messing up my source images by forgetting some aspect about them gives them a, clumly, uh, a clumsiness that I can't replicate if I'm trying to do it on purpose. But these are two of my first starting images that I was looking at. And so at the end of like my interiors, exterior, so this was actually the first kind of cloud painting I made. I took one of the environments here that I've been doing in the series with two oil derricks there. It's kind of almost a symmetrical balanced composition, but with the, the path from the earlier photo that I showed you pulling out a little bit toward the left. Uh, my, my road as a person also, I'm a little bit more on the left and I will try to walk towards the center, although that's a little tough. And around this, they have different things like hands and feet and stars. And uh, this is very much kind of like a little attempt uh, that's a little clumsy with fewer parts in them. Uh, but this is me also trying to negotiate how I was gonna start building uh, these compositions. And the greatest thing about this too, is you can start to create a narrative about the figure, but in all these, you never really see the entire character behind the actions of all the stuff, which is kind of what I like uh, because it creates this concept of kind of like the Wizard of Oz, where the man behind the curtain that you never see is really the person pulling and doing all the stuff. And this was another one I did later in that year. This is Riot Nimbus Peak. These have really kind of like go action, uh, kind of uh, just really simple word verb kind of direct titles. Uh, I wanted them kind of like that really aggressive and abrasive. So you can start seeing more things I'm adding in here. Pencils, bullets, candies. There's a lot of rocks and stones, different kind of uh, symbols that start to get a little bit more aggressive. You'll see soldier's boots and sometimes soldier's boots with a toe coming out of it. Uh, kind of referencing, you know, whether we put 
uh, soldiers' feet on the ground or not, and if we're going to put them on the ground, if they're equipped enough, and other stuff like that. Uh, this is Nimbus Kick Stomp. Nimbus is just another word for a cloud uh, from 2016. So these are some of the ones I was starting to do at the beginning of the year. Uh, in here, I have a protest sign. It's blank, bombs, pencils again. Pencils are great because they do two kinds of things, right? Pencils are sharp and can be used as weapons, but also, too, pencils are creative things, which, which draw and design, but also, too, they are important for writing bills. So the duality of a pencil is an image and it doing lots of things is very important. So I have rockets and rocks, the Confederate uh, flag hat up here, and then a gun and, of course, different hands and feet, and all this is moving around. Part of the reason you can see these starting to warm up and get really busy, uh, you'll see a lot of the different stuff that's repeated in almost all the paintings. But part of what I'm interested in more than just creating or putting different things in each painting is the sequence of how you read the painting different uh, based on uh, the arrangement of how you juxtaposition one thing next to each other. So if a gun is next to a rocket that's next to a foot that's next to a pencil, how you would read that. And one of the things that came out of this is I was, uh, I'd received a, a text from a student about something, it was one of my student leaders, and I said something back and they sent me this emoji strand, which was like eight emojis in a row, and I had absolutely no idea how to read it, but I was completely fascinated with it. And I said, what does that mean? And it was a really simple explanation that I just wouldn't have got reading the pictures. And I thought how interesting it was that, you know, we had people basically of the younger generation that were using the phones to recreate a kind of very simple type of hieroglyphics. They were talking in pictured uh, sequences. And so that kind of went into my thinking of the construction of how I was putting these together. This is Ignition, which is on the cover of the catalog for the show. Here's my one shameless plug. If you've been to the show and you like the show and you want to see a catalog of this work, there are catalogs for sale in the gallery. T. Mike will hook you up. This is the painting that's on the cover. Uh, in this one, sometimes I will pull back some of the elements just to really focus on the moving and explosion of the cloud. You can see also what's neat about this one is that it is removed from the context of the landscape and is more just in a space of itself, kind of like the nebula picture that was there at the beginning. So. I go back and forth between wanting to ground these in a landscape and wanting to pull them out. And also too, playing with the formal abstraction of just building up these shapes, which seem to be building, stacking, or exploding out towards the viewer. The challenge of these paintings, like I talked about earlier, was to move in the same way in which we were receiving information. So one, to be visually overwhelmed, but two, to deal with the idea of spin and how we're pushed around by the media to move in different ways. So when you see these, you kind of fall into the picture, you get spun around, but by the time you hit this inner shape, because it is the lightest, uh, it usually is trying to push you or force you back out of the picture. So we're not falling into these pictures in the same way in which you would fall into, uh, you know, let's say the School of Athens or a painting like that, that is a traditional kind of Renaissance step to where there's a clear background, middle ground, foreground, and you just kind of walk into the picture like it's a window into the world. Uh, this is Open Carry Storms Vary from 2016. Once again, now the cloud becomes a little bit more balanced. You see things that I hadn't introduced, uh, shotgun shells, wedding rings. Uh, these apples uh, I start to put in, which are uh, biblical and reference somewhat, you know, with how much uh, knowledge should we gain and just the core of like just throwing something out. So, uh, you know, kind of the information that we get and then what remains or what we do with that information once we've got it. Also, hands full of cash, you know, we're consumers. So I like the idea of uh, just like fistfuls of money, uh, things like that. And this is uh, my painting, Shotgun Caesar Tempest. This is from Art of the South opening uh, 2016 where uh, I got the best of show award and feature artist. And what was cool about this is Number, Numbers Magazine uh, has this show every year. Uh, they didn't have it of COVID last year, but they have it every year. And it's a really great show. Uh, survey of contemporary southern art and if you win the best of show the award is is that they do this feature with you and you usually get interviewed by another artist and the artist that interviewed me was donna mosley who's a or donna woodley sorry who's a friend of mine now and uh we just had a really good time talking and meeting and had it not been for this i hadn't got to i would have got to be friends with her uh but <clears throat> again understand when i first started showing these paintings uh, in comparison to the narrative and figurative paintings I was doing before, uh, 
you know, it was not the quickest response. I think people didn't really quite know what they were looking at. 